studio with uh, Bill Stubblefield, and we've been joined by Sheriff Nate Harmon and Mike Lang. So, and Mike, you are, what's your title? The Chief, Chief Court Marshal. Oops, I should tell you what, I'll turn on your microphones and everything. So, uh, Chief Court Marshal. Okay. So, okay. we're doing... <laughs> so... We are here, Bill. Why don't you why don't you take this? Uh, yeah, uh, a couple of nights ago, uh, there's a group of us uh, sitting around with civil discussion, and uh, including um, uh, Delegate Mike uh, Mike Height, Mike Lang, um, the uh, Magistrate Daryl Scholl, and Gary Wine. And one of the subjects that came up was that of mental hygiene transportation. We're liable. Uh, by state code uh, to uh, to have and the sheriff and Mike will discuss this much better more eloquent than I can but we're 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 liable to transport someone in the mental hygiene program back to West Virginia for I mean excuse me Martinsburg for court hearing the problem comes in the amount of expense in both terms of dollars and manpower uh, most of the folks, many of the folks, are housed in the Parkersburg area. So that would require a two people driving from Martinsburg to Parkersburg or somewhere in uh, that part of the state, pick up someone for a hearing, bring them back to Berkeley County for a hearing that could last 15 minutes or a couple of hours at the very most. Then folks driving back to Parkersburg to drop them off. Uh, and uh, not only is that expense-wise expense with, with dollars, uh, but also manpower. For uh, It's recently been shifted from the sheriff under the sheriff's uh, responsibility to Mike Lang's responsibility as court security. Now, when it was under the sheriff's responsibility, that meant we had two debtors that could be patrolling that were committed to something else. In the case of Mike Lang, he has folks that could be involved with court security that are now going to, uh, to Parkersburg for the distance. It's Much of this is embedded in code. In code. Uh, two questions that emerge, and I'd like for the sheriff and Mike to address this. Uh, two questions that emerge is one, why cannot this be done by Zoom? And it's my understanding that this is something that could be done, or some some remote some, uh, something similar to Zoom, that could be done remotely without the expense of going physically picking someone up and coming back for a very short hearing. This, I think, is under the domain of some advisory board within the state. The other one is, why can we not use a facility to house these somewhere closer to Berkeley County? And I think there are facilities such as this is in Hagerstown. So if we could reside, or uh, if these individuals could be in Hagerstown, then it's a non-issue. Going and picking them up and bringing them back, it'd be very short. That is in code. Uh, so the reason of having these two gentlemen on today is discuss, flesh out something that is a major expense to the county, to the taxpayers, also a, a major imposition on the, on the employees that we have working for either the sheriff or Mike Lang, something that I did not know anything about. I had a very, very casual appreciation that there was something involved, but certainly not to the magnitude that we have now. So that's why we have them on board. And just to be clear, the target of these transports are people who have been arrested and then adjudicated as mental health issues or? Well, it's good. It encompasses mental mental hygiene uh, transportation after they've been uh, court ordered and committed. Um, juvenile transports. Um, uh, we we broaden actually we've expanded the program mike's done a, a lot of the heavy lifting for the sheriff's department but um you know getting right into it uh, um bill's correct we uh, legislative session going from 21 to 22 um they uh, saw 
the need to try to come up with a pilot program that would address this issue and um, they actually named specifically some counties to do so. I think Cabell County was one, Berkeley County was another. There's a couple other counties in there. So that's when uh, we started having these conversations was July last year. And um, within those com uh, conversations, uh, Mike and I brokered a deal with the county commission that uh, Mike had the uh, resources available to assist the sheriff's office with these transportations. A and I, I can't uh, thank Mike enough for the efforts that he's helped. I mean, it's the sheriff's office overseeing program, but he's done all the heavy lifting, really. And uh, just to give you an idea, the man hours that's been consumed within the program in terms of Bill talking about previously a certified officer being taken off the street here in Berkeley County and making these trips, uh, the transportation division has saved literally 3.9, almost four months worth of man hours alone in uh, uh, keeping a certified officer on the streets here in Berkeley County to help service the community. So that's over 14,000 man hours. How many transports are there per unit of time? Uh, it, it fluctuates. It fluctuates. It varies. It could be uh, one Friday we had six people out. Today I have two out doing transports. So it, it's, it's, you can't plan for it. Uh, it happens. It's very, uh, we have to be reactive. We, there's no proactive to it. But looking at it in kind of net, since February the 1st, there have been over nearly 725 man hours since February the 1st and over 17, nearly 18,000 miles just for mental hygiene alone. And the bulk of that is going into the southwest part of the, uh, of the state. And it is, you say it's for mental hygiene. It's actually the, they are in the southwest part of the state to receive treatment, right? And then they come back here for legal related hearings, not mental health related hearings. Uh, possibly. Now, Mike's got a recent experience in terms of having to transport someone uh, from uh, an area far away to a hearing and then transport them back. I'll let Mike talk about that. Yeah, it was just this week uh, we had an order to pick a guy up in Parkersburg, have him at the sheriff's office by uh, 1,400 hours for a final commit order. So we completed that, and after the hearing, he was then sent, sent to Sharps, which is in Weston. So we did another, we had 23, which actually was 46 man hours on his one trip. So we had two teams tied up all day, and I did a staggered start. So one of them started 2 o'clock in the morning, and the other one came in at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, and... and this is just one occasion of this. You know, th this program uh, is, is working. Uh, it takes a lot of moving parts to make this work, a lot of forward thinking on the sheriff's part, the county council's part, county administrator. It's, and I'm blessed. The, go the guys I have on staff are all mostly retired correction officers from the state of Maryland. And they're well-versed in this. They're well-trained in transports. So it was a win-win when we started talking about this. So we, we got to thank all those folks involved to make this happen. When we started this with the sheriff, we never made claims we were going to save money. We were going to save man hours to the sheriff's office, which is much needed. And how many marshals are there? I have 36 on staff. I have four designated for this. I could use four more tomorrow. And how many deputies on staff? Uh, there's 67. Okay. So that's, that's a significant chunk, actually, out of... of of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can go to for full circle with this. Uh, there's a meeting coming up Friday to address some more of administrative commissioner uh, topics uh, on the administration end of it um, that we'll talk about. But at the same time, uh, Mike and I will sit down eventually here in the coming months and write up this uh, program and it's uh, in its entirety and include the statistics that Bill and, and Mike have brought up today and present it to the legislation as our pilot program. And hopefully, you know, other agencies can follow the example and tout 
the fact that we need mental hygiene facilities and MAUs uh, across state lines. Yeah, or another way to look at this is uh, uh, utilizing technology. Uh, we've The COVID has told us one thing, taught us one big lesson, that technology can be used in a variety of ways. And then the, uh, but this, this can be fixed the, uh, by, by state code or by uh, various uh, bureaucratic boards that we have. But it needs to be looked at. We've been talking about mental health, and I, I don't want to bore people with too many numbers, but mental health around 725 man hours since February the 1st. We also have court order man trips over 300 man hours since February the 1st. We have arrangement man hours nearly 270 since February the 1st. Uh, court order juvenile man hours. So all of these require escort and transportation. Some probably do require face-to-face uh, meetings. And that's not what I'm addressing. What I'm addressing is this massive amount of labor, so labor intensive, and also the, work, the expense involved with operating vehicle. Is there a better way to do it than what we have right now? Have solutions been, been, been proposed and rejected by the legislature? Or is your proposal going to be the first one? Our proposal will be the first one, and it will get in the weeds in terms of what Bill just mentioned. And you're going to bring that up at the next session? Yes. Yeah. So th we're fortunate in uh, Eastern Panhandle uh, uh, of having, I guess that's true throughout the state, but I'm most familiar with Eastern Panhandle. We have, ser we have delegates, we have senators that are very closely attuned to, to our needs. I have little doubt that this will, once it's brought to the attention of our legislators, that something be done. So I'm not throwing stones mm -hmm. at our legislators. As the sheriff's pointed out, this has not been an issue that's been formally presented, and so we have a problem. It's, it's been hinted at, but never formally presented. But I think this time, this session, it will be formally presented. And I, I think either using technology or changing the code that we can have a facility and in, a, in the adjacent county or adjacent state will can rectify and fix this issue. But right now, it's a huge expense that's been basically transparent to the general public. And this is not unique to Berkeley County, right? No, and I, and I want to at least give legislation, uh, last legislation year, uh, a lot of credit for trying to reform the DHHR, but also coming up with a reimbursement of expenditures for these trips, specifically mental hygiene, that are taken. Because when you count in, uh, as Bill pointed out, some of the numbers in terms of trips, uh, mental hygiene alone in terms of wear and tear on a vehicle and mileage is, you know, mental hygiene's almost 18,000 uh, miles on these vehicles. So it, the, that reimbursement effort that they put through really, really helped a bunch. So uh, shifting gears a little bit, a couple months ago, uh, Sheriff, you, you kicked a hornet's nest in oh. here talking about school security issues. Mm -hmm. And now a couple of months have passed by. There were some meetings, some promises made. And how are we doing? Are you, are you happy with the progress on school security issues? I'm, I'm not happy um, on the, uh, the uh, SRO uh, fundings that uh, the... Uh, board has has mentioned uh, i'm not happy simply because it just hasn't happened yet they've they're talking about it they're figuring i guess uh ways out to um get it funded but i understood the board to provide funding for um three additional sros uh we're not there yet and i you know i i will admittedly say that probably one of my flaws is I'm not patient and I'm definitely not patient in this issue but uh, so I'm not happy on that and why I am happy that the school administration the executive staff is now um, on board with a school safety subcommittee that I chair and that pupil services uh, co-chairs and uh, it, we have had uh, amazing conversations uh, with those with these subcommittees and, and will continue to do so and uh, I think that it's important that uh, all the stakeholders involved with uh, our school's safety uh, sit at this table and at least understand more holistically what takes place when someone puts in a work order 
uh, how these upgrades are going to be uh, done, what's prioritized uh, in terms of, of the upgrades and, you know, exactly where that $9 million is going to go from the levy. And um, it, th this is a, a very good uh, meeting to help uh, school administration with that. Sheriff, to kind of frame the issue over the SROs. Uh, school resource officers. Yeah, school resource officers. Uh, there's a couple, three questions. Uh, one, how many do we have in place now? Second question is, what is the targeted number of SROs we'll have? Third question is, what is the number that you think would be most appropriate? Well, um, what we have now is three. We have a, a school resource officer in the high schools. Uh, city has a fourth one at uh, Martinsburg. And um, I've been touting a program that allows me to have uh, uh, three more SROs that are mobile and that can move around, uh, North District, South District, and Centralized. Um, in all honesty, we could use uh, eight to 12. Eight more, eight additional ones? Eight more additional ones, yes. Um, uh, of course, um, I would have loved to seen legislatively some funding conduits for that, but, um, you know, you have to, you have to find folks that uh, want to do this job, that are passionate about this job, you know, so, uh, you know, do you go with a uh, retired officer who's got 15 plus years in, or do you go with, uh, you know, volling, telling somebody at the department mm -hmm. who's got three, three years worth of experience in, so there's some programs out there that we're looking into. Yeah, uh, uh, the type of individual is important, but right now I'm looking at just the money. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about six to seven would be your uh, target number, but you could easily utilize another eight. Now, most of the schools that you've mentioned are high school with an SRO, mm -hmm. but yet some of these nationwide shootings we have have been elementary mm -hmm. and, uh, and middle school. Mm -hmm. uh, is there, uh, if you're able to integrate fully, I would imagine that you'd have even distribution among all levels of schools, is that correct? Yes, and that's that's one of the reasons why I want, uh, you know, I think floating SROs are very specific. Yeah, they have a home base, but keeping them moving, uh, keeping, uh, you know, unannounced visits, safety checks and whatnot, uh, there's a gamut of things that can be addressed just having mobile SROs. Well, there's another aspect of this that you've, you've raised in the past, and that's the hardening of the schools themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, many of our schools are old schools, mm -hmm. uh, and so it's much more difficult to go in and retrofit uh, and harden. Uh, relative to the SROs, where does the hardening of the schools fit in as far as dollars available? Well, um, if I understand your question correctly, as far as expenditures into actual structural yeah. upgrades, well, there, there definitely needs to be um, emphasis on the observation areas and access to the schools. Um, I think that there that money needs to be spent on preventable measures, you know, see something, say something, because statistically you'll find most situations someone knew about a concerning behavior and, and didn't report it, and that was goes all the way to an individual's a suspect's um, peer group. You know, they, you know, they didn't, uh, they saw concerning behavior but didn't report it, so there needs to be an effort there. Um, uh, but at the same time, I think this, the school safety subcommittee can help with the school system and, and building maintenance in terms of prioritizing what, what needs it most right now. And let's move from that point. And, uh, you know, educating our SROs and sending them to annual training and making sure that we do have qualified people that are socializing with the kids and, and, and getting to know the kids uh, on a, uh, a more personable level. You address the possible sources for school uh, resource officers, but n not necessarily the qualification. Are these are these sworn officers when the, when they're SROs yes. with the rest authority and all of that. Yes. So they become addition essentially sheriff's deputies assigned to the school. Yes. Okay. Uh, there is a, a special deputy um, statute that. Uh, if uh, my discussions with the superintendent uh, stand uh, firm that uh, we might go uh, that route with uh, additional people, not necessarily a Berkeley County sworn law enforcement officer, but a special deputy. Do you see a time where specially trained um, teachers can 
Does carry, conceal carry? In the I schools? do. I'm a big advocate of the Guardian program. I believe in concealed carry uh, with these folks, and, and you got to keep them guessing. Uh, we need to keep up with the times. We need to evolve with the times. And I'm a huge, I wrote up a Guardian program and presented it legislatively. It just didn't get traction. I think there was a Senator Tarr that presented a, a Guardian like program. He and I have been in discussions, and I'm, I'm sure it'll be uh, a topic of additional discussion in this legislation. Yeah, much of our discussion, and deservedly so, has been on schools and the sheriff's role. There's another aspect that does not get mentioned as much, and that is court security. What challenge are you seeing, Mike, for court security? Just the sheer number of folks who come in there every day. Um, annually, we're experiencing up to 130,000 people who come in the building daily, uh, uh, yearly. Uh, we have over 3,000 inmates annually that come through. We're just overwhelmed with the number of people. Uh, we're running out of room. You know, we just added the sixth magistrate in July, uh, July, January 2025. We're adding a new family court, a new magistrate, and half of a circuit judge that will float between Berkeley and Morgan counties. It's just a sheer volume we're, we're dealing with. Now, how much of your expenses is borne at, by the Supreme Court? Or is all of it been borne by the county? All of my expenses are, are borne by the county. Uh, the Supreme Court does pay rent to the county, but it don't touch don't touch the bottom line that we, we cost the county. But do we you, provide do you, a very needed service. Do you have courthouse groupies? Do you have regulars who show up every day to watch trials? No, sir. No, I've <laughs> never experienced that. <laughs> okay. Because they're, they're all open, right? I mean, yes, sir. And, uh, except juvenile and family. Every other court's open. All right, we've got about 30 seconds left before we go to our last break. Any of you gentlemen want to make I, a final point? I just thanks for having us on board uh, to bring this uh, to light. It's, it's much needed. Uh, it was a great burden to the sheriff's office, and we have to thank the sheriff for his forward thinking and seeing uh, how we could help. Well, uh, Mike's definitely being modest. He's, he's done the heavy lifting for me, but make no doubt about it. I'm a big fan of Berkeley County First, and uh, presenting this program legislatively and us being at the tip of the spear of that example, I couldn't be prouder. I can't thank you guys enough for coming in. We'll be back for a final minute in a minute or two.